Okay. Okay. So I'm recording these lectures and they'll be in um, a YouTube playlist. So I also teach um, bio 1101. So, but this should take you right to the bio 2100 playlist. So just make sure you're watching the right videos, obviously. Um, so that's where I'll put all of them, one link to get to all of them. If you wanna see them again, or if you miss a class, they'll be there. Um, okay, so the, the modules are where you'll find most of the really important information. Um, so the, like I said, I'm putting up two different file forms of the, of the PowerPoints. So this PDF is sort of that handout version where you have <clears throat> three lines next to each slide. So something like that. If that's helpful for you to print out, you can download it by clicking on that um, or just the PowerPoint file. I will say if you just look at the PowerPoint file on here and I had a student point this out to me last semester, things get cut off. I don't know if it's the setting Sorry guys, yeah. I'm not sure if it's the setting for your browser, like the view, but a lot of times words will get cut off. So you wanna download the actual PowerPoint file if you wanna look at it and you just click on that link at the top here. Okay, so that's where all of that is. And um, I put these PowerPoints up one chapter at a time. So it's gonna be a lot of slides but I'll go through them over the course of two or three class periods. Um, it's just easier for me to kind of group them all into one file and then you have less files to deal with as well. Um, so we're not gonna go through one of these entire PowerPoint files every class, it's a lot of information. Okay, on to the assignments. <clears throat> First, I want to talk about that out the chapter outline. <clears throat> so I put um, just an ungraded instruction thing at the top here. So if you click on the chapter outline instructions, so your chapter one outline is due Monday. And I'll show you, I posted an online version I emailed you guys, um, a PDF version of a textbook that you can use chapter one for. After that, you're going to want to use the official textbook, the Saladin textbook for the course. Um, but I kind of just give you a basic um, instructions on what I'm expecting for these chapter outlines. I described it on Wednesday. It's very open-ended. So whatever works for you, as long as it's a fairly thorough explanation of the chapter, that's fine. So I also put in, if there's at the end of each of the salad in chapters, there's before you go on questions. So if you just wanna answer those before you go on questions, they help really help summarize that section as well. So you can answer those and that can be your outline. Um, you wanna answer them, like I said, in enough detail. Um, it'll be sort of, you'll try to have to figure out what amount of detail works best for you. Um, but you don't need extreme detail. Like I said, a one page single spaced bulleted online or outline is probably fine in a Word document. <clears throat> Um, I put the guidelines at the bottom. So the grading guidelines, like I said, it's kind of a two one zero. Did you do a good job? Did you do an okay job? Or did you not do it or plagiarize it? So it's a two one zero. Um, and if you're not sure if something you're doing, like, a, I don't know if you have some other idea of how to outline a chapter and you don't know if it's acceptable, you can email me or just turn it in the first time and I'll let you know if that's not really what I'm looking for. But the answer will probably be yes, that's fine. Um, so you're going to submit all of these online. It can be a picture of handwritten outline. Um, it can be a Word document. It can be kind of, I guess those are kind of the two, a PDF, whatever. Um, and you will submit them to each of the chapter, chapter outline assignments that I've put up here. So I put them all up under the assignments tab. So the chapter one outline is due at the beginning of class on Monday. Whoops, that's chapter two, sorry. Whatever. Chapter one, there we go. Um, so, I also allowed a text entry box. If you just want to copy and paste it into Canvas, that's fine. Um, what else about that? So it does have to be uploaded just so I have them all in one place since half of you are on Zoom and half of you are in person. Um, I don't, I'm gonna 
I'm just going to get confused if I have different forms coming in. So that's why I say, if you want to handwrite it, don't turn it into me. Just take a picture and upload it. That's fine. Or scan it with a scanning app on your phone. Um, so that's the outline assignment. The oh, I'll show you where the um, the PDF of the OpenStax textbook is that I talked about. I told you in the email, but it's under files. I didn't put it anywhere else. It's going to be that anatomy and physiology PDF right here. So you can use that for chapter one, like I said, um, until you get the, the official textbook for the course. Um, after that, it doesn't have as much detail as the Saladin does, so I'd rather you use the Saladin textbook. Um, but that's there for reference throughout the semester if you want to look at a different textbook or um, if you don't have the textbook yet for chapter one outline. Any questions about that assignment? Anyone on Zoom? I don't want to forget about you guys. Okay. Uh, next assignment, not due for a while, um, but it's due in parts. So I want to talk about all the parts in general um, today, just so you are kind of um, ready and know what to expect. All right. So the disease presentation. So. Um, you guys on Zoom, if you just want to click on that disease presentation assignment details, that will show you basically what I'm showing the class here. Um, okay, so this will be a group project. Like I said, you guys are going to make a video about a specific disease. And I have a list of diseases at the bottom. The ones I hand, I'm going to smack this all the time. The ones I handed out to you, um, I'm going to have you cross some off because I want my 8 a.m. class and my 10 a.m. class doing different diseases. And I forgot to split them on that hard copy. The information online is correct. So um, there's a set of diseases that you can choose from, a lot of which you may not know. <clears throat> um, but what you're going to do first, do February 1st. So the first part of this is just to rank your choices. So you probably don't know what a lot of these are. So you might have to just do a little bit of internet research as to what you might find interesting. Um, if you don't give me a ranking, I'm just going to put you where it works best for the rest of the class. Uh, but after you do a little bit of investigation, you're going to select your disease and then um, complete a, an Excel file. So let's see, that will be here, the disease selection assignment. So um, the Excel file, if I click on it here, it'll look a little funky, but I'll download it. So you're going to download this form and just rank your top five choices. So this is what it will look like. You're just going to put your name in there. Um, and then number one is going to be your top choice. Number five is your lowest choice. And I'm going to try to put you in your top three. Um, I can't make any promises, but this will be in groups of two or three, depending on how things fall out. Um, that's due by February 1st. So all you do, download this fill it out, re-upload it to that assignment by February 1st, um, what I say, 11.59, I think, so by the end of the day. And then I'll group you guys into um, the, the groups you'll be working in for the rest of the semester, or for the, yeah, most of the rest of the semester. Um, for you guys that have the hard copy, oh my gosh. Um, for you guys that have the hard copy, you will cut off everything above uh, above gout. So dermatitis to lupus, you're not choosing from those. So that's just on here. So if you look at the online version, it's correct. Um, and I think even the document I put on there is correct with your options. So dermatitis to lupus, you don't get to choose from gout, yay, all the way down to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, you get to choose from. Um, like I said, a lot of these, you won't know what they are. I'm not super familiar with a lot of them, which is kind of why I chose them, because I want to learn more about them. Um, so yeah, just do that ranking by February 1st. After that, um, the next part of this is going to be um, an outline, and you're going to submit it to uh, the symposium. So the uh, once you have the outline, 
it's pretty much ready to be submitted to the symposium. You just have to kind of give a summary and a title for your presentation for the Piedmont Symposium as to what you're going to do. Whoops, sorry, right there. Um, so I'll talk more about that after I've kind of split you guys into groups, but you'll have a few weeks to actually put that outline together with your group. You basically just want to tell me what you're going to be talking about and who's responsible for each of the topics. You'll submit it to the symposium, um, which is due February 26th. <clears throat> And then the big, like the meat of this assignment is going to be um, obviously making the video and then watching everyone else's videos and kind of summarizing them and asking questions. So for the actual presentation, you're going to use Zoom. I guess you could use what, uh, yeah, whatever video recording option you want. But you're going to record a video of you guys presenting about an eight to 10 minute explanation of this disease. And you want to include these seven aspects that I've listed here um, for, uh, for the video. So name of the disease, that won't take very long. And then you're gonna go into what causes it, what are the signs and the symptoms, um, how does the disease affect the body. The epidemiology and statistics, that's kind of what, is there a certain segment of the population that's more prone to it? Um, is it a socioeconomic issue? Is it um, an age issue, that kind of stuff. And then treatment. So how do you treat it? How do you avoid it? Um, any information about how to basically cure it or not get it in the first place. And then you'll have a work cited, but you'll just show that. That won't really take up any time in the eight to 10 minutes. You'll just show a slide with your sources. So you will be using outside sources. Um, I'll talk more about that as we kind of get into the project as well. That's gonna be due March 26th. So a month after you submit the outline, you wanna have the video done. So you're gonna post that to a discussion board. So you'll upload it to YouTube, post that link to the discussion board so everyone else in the class can watch. Um, and then everyone else in the class is gonna watch all of the other presenters. It should be about um, five to seven other videos that you'll be watching. And then you're just gonna kind of summarize what they talked about and um, ask a question. So you're gonna ask a question of every, each of the um, groups. That's an individual assignment. So making the video and all of all of up to making the video is gonna be a group. And then <clears throat> after that, it's all individual. And then finally at the end, just a really simple kind of wrap up to um, this presentation assignment, go all the way down, is the peer evaluation. So I know a lot of people really dislike group work. A lot of people really like it. And most people are kind of like, yeah, it's fine. You're somewhere in the middle. So the peer evaluation, is an opportunity for me to see how well your group worked together. Did anyone do most of the work? Did someone really not pull their weight um, and do any of the work? And if you're having issues, don't wait until the end to tell me, I guess. This is kind of a, an on paper official kind of evaluation of how your group worked together. But if you're having issues with someone doing their work, please let me know ahead of time. Um, I can talk to them, we can try to work something out. Um, I don't want one or two, even two people in the group to do most of the work. Everyone should um, put in equal effort. Um, and uh, yeah, the peer evaluation is a way to kind of officially see that, but don't wait until then if you're having issues, please. Please let me know. Okay, so there's, yeah, your all's possible disease topics. And I'll create assignments for uploading all this other stuff as we go along. Okay, so any questions about that? And I'll have more details about the symposium as that gets closer as well. Questions from anyone on Zoom? Okay. So those are the two assignments I wanted to talk about. I talked about the Canvas organization. If you ever can't find something on Canvas, please email me or ask me in class. Oh, bonus for SNAP attendance. Someone asked about that. Um, I don't know when the SNAP groups are gonna start and I'm still kind of waiting to see how that's gonna fall out before figuring out what kind of, if I'm gonna offer bonus points for going to any of those SNAP tutoring sessions, which can be really helpful. So I probably will offer some bonus, but I'm not sure how many meetings there will be before the first exam. So I'm gonna wait to see that, um, wait until those kind of that schedule comes out and then I'll let you know about that. Oh, and green gold switch. So if you're in the green group, 
and you want to be in the gold group or vice versa. I've already had one person switch in here because um, classes on either side were online. And rather than being in person in between that, um, it kind of made sense to switch. So if you do want to switch, I can't promise it, but there is obviously room in here. So, and there's room in the second half as well for the people on Zoom. So if you really want to switch to the gold group, green guys, or you guys on gold want to switch to green, let me know, um, email me or come talk to me after class if you're in here. And um, that shouldn't be a problem. So whatever works out best with your schedule, I don't want to put any, um, any extra stress on you for having to run from an online class in your dorm to an in-person class here and then back to an online class. So I forgot to mention that on Wednesday, I apologize. Okay. That gets all that out of the way. Let's stop sharing here. All right, so we got, oh, we didn't actually get into any material. I think I just finished going over the syllabus with you guys. So we'll start um, at the beginning here with some sort of background and basic material of some major kind of themes and organizing principles. Oh my gosh. Um, themes and organizing principles of anatomy and physiology. All right. There. Just raise your hand. Um, I don't usually use this, but it's a little easier to talk in. And I think it helps, especially in a class where there's a lot of weird words for you guys to be able to see my mouth. If you can't hear me, I feel like my voice is being reflected back at me. Um, just let me know. You guys on Zoom too, if the sound isn't good or I walk too far away, please let me know. Sometimes I forget. Okay. So the scope of anatomy and physiology, it's very broad. It's only one, one species, which is nice. We're only talking about homo sapiens, um, but we know a lot about ourselves, which is good and bad. Um, so first I want to define anatomy and then physiology. I think I sort of did this, I think, um, on Wednesday. But anatomy, the anatomy side of this class is going to be the study of the form. So the different structures of our body. The bones of the skeleton are a really good example. Like I said, you guys are gonna know pretty much all the bones of the skeleton by the end of the semester. <clears throat> so that's anatomy, just what are we made of? And then we have the physiology aspect, which is how all of those pieces function together. So we have form and we have function. And that's gonna be one of our major themes that I'll talk about in just a second, how form and function are really closely related. So muscle contraction is a really good example of a function. So you'll know the muscles, you'll know a lot of the muscles of the body, not all of them. There's 8 million, not literally, maybe like 800, I think. Um, but you'll know a good portion of them and you're also gonna learn how they contract. So the physiology behind how they actually allow us to bend our arm or jump or whatever. <clears throat> okay, so I think it's probably pretty obvious why we take AMP. Um, how many people in here did I ask this? How many people are interested in like a medical some kind of medical field or career. So most people, um, so that can include doctor, nurse, um, physical therapist, uh, PA, exercise science, all of that is something medical and then beyond, obviously. Um, so it's very obvious why most of you will need anatomy and physiology. It's gonna be the base for a lot of the other classes that get into a lot more detail about the human body and its function. Um, I came from not a medical background at some point. I don't know if I said this in here. I wanted to be a vet until I took ninth grade biology and I got really scared when I had to dissect something. So I thought, uh, maybe medical field is not for me. 
So I kind of moved away from that, but I'm still kind of fascinated by human anatomy and physiology, mostly because I'm interested as a human as to how we work and my health in a lot of ways and my family's health. So I know this is sort of a, I don't know, maybe a little bit cheesy or too broad, but for your own health, it's really good to know how you work. And when something's going wrong, you'll have a better idea. Hopefully nothing ever goes wrong for you. But if something goes wrong, you'll have a better idea of why that might be. Like I'm rubbing my shoulder right now. I have a really sore um, trapezius muscle right here. And I'm like, okay, I know when I use my trap. Um, so I try not to use it as much. Mostly picking up my chunky little son is what's <laughs> kind of stressing that out. Um, so trying not to do that. It's a really simple, even every day, like knowing how your body works can really help in the long run, especially as you age. So just being sort of an owner of your own health and knowing when a doctor is telling you something, kind of having a better understanding of what he or she is saying is really helpful, along with as parents age, siblings, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it just gives you a little bit more ownership over yourself. Okay, so I'm going to go into a few themes here about um, a few thing, themes that will pop up over and over again throughout this course. One of them being um, sort of the structure of humans. And obviously, it's pretty broad. But what I'm talking about here specifically is what's called the hierarchy of complexity. And um, if you remember, if you took uh, Bio 1101, we talked about this also way at the beginning of the semester. Just the fact that um, atoms are going to work together to form molecules, molecules work together to form cells, cells work together to form tissues. So you have this hierarchical structure. And eventually you get to the whole organism. So the simplest component of us, you can break us all the way down into individual atoms. You can build all those atoms together, like I said, into molecules, into cells, into tissues, into organs, all the way up to an entire organism. So we'll talk about these different levels, and I won't really refer to it as the, the hierarchy of complexity, but um, that's why we're talking about, when we get into the chemistry chapter, that's why we're talking about chemistry, because we function because of chemistry. That's why all of life functions. So understanding how that works is kind of necessary to understanding how our muscles contract, for example. So if we look at this in a graphic, form. At the top, you have sort of the simplest, smallest form of structure, that lowest level of organization. I know it's at the top. This should probably be flipped. So the smallest level of organization, we have atoms and molecules. Like I said, those are going to work together to form a cell. So in this case, it's a smooth muscle cell. You guys will know exactly what that is once we go through um, the histology chapter. So smooth muscle cell, a bunch of those are going to work together. So you see all these little dots here. Sorry, you guys cannot see me. Let's do that. All of the little dots are nuclei of those cells. So that's the smooth muscle tissue. So a bunch of cells working together are going to form a tissue. You'll learn all about the different kinds of tissues. A bunch of tissues working together is going to form an organ. So in this case, we're moving into the urinary tract system. So a lot of smooth muscle tissue forms the bladder. So the bladder is just one organ in the organ system of the urinary tract. So along with the bladder, there's kidneys, um, there's ureter, urethra, et cetera, that all form together to help us rid our bodies of liquid waste. So an organ, Organs working together form an organ system. Obviously, all of our organ systems together make us the whole organism. Um, so that's how we can break it down. And like I said, I'm not going to um, directly refer to this idea, but you'll see this throughout the semester, this idea of uh, this hierarchical structure that makes us us. One that I will refer to over and over again, this theme, structure determines function. And you'll see this throughout when we're looking at um, individual different types of cells. Cells have different shapes. Those different shapes mean they can function in different ways. So all the way down to that cellular level, you can break it down to molecules as well, um, all the way up to sort of our skeleton, our musculoskeletal system. If we um, didn't have all of these bones in our hand, we wouldn't be able to grasp 
a pipe, I guess in this case, that's what that is. If we just had like one big bone as a hand, like a, a flipper, we wouldn't have that function of being able to grasp and manipulate things like we can. So the structure of our skeleton and our muscles allows for the function of holding onto things. It seems minor, but that kind of plays throughout the body. Um, in the middle there, you see a heart. We won't get into the cardiovascular system. That's for AMP2. But the heart is structured in a very specific way to allow for the function of getting oxygenated blood where it needs to go, bringing deoxygenated blood where it needs to go back towards the lungs. Um, so blood moves through the heart in a really specific way through the four chambers um, based on whether it has oxygen or not. So the function of the heart is based on its structure. If it were structured differently, the function would likely be different. And if you break it down to something really simple like eating, if we didn't have a mouth that opened, so we didn't have the muscles to open a mouth, we didn't just have, we didn't have the opening into our esophagus and digestive system, we didn't have the nerves to allow for that, we wouldn't be able to ingest solid food as we currently know it, right? So breaking it down to even something simple like that, just the structure of our mouths, the skeleton and the muscles and the nerves, all of that um, allows us to eat solid food like we eat solid food. So this is why we talk about anatomy and physiology together, because that structure is gonna determine how something functions. If you know about the function, but not the structure, you don't really have that holistic understanding and vice versa. Okay, so structure determines function, that's gonna come up many, many, many other times. So get used to seeing that relationship. <clears throat> the ne next theme is gonna be homeostasis. How many people have at least heard the term homeostasis before? Yeah, most people, right? Sorry guys on Zoom, I can't see. You can, I guess you can give me a thumbs up if you've heard of homeostasis. Um, so most people know the term. And a lot of times we think about it from sort of a, a non-human kind of animal perspective, but all homeostasis is most or all living organisms have some form of homeostasis where they maintain a stable internal environment. So that's all homeostasis is. If you break it down to the Latin, um, homeostasis means steady state. So just kind of keeping steady um, within the internal environment. So that's all we can really control. Obviously we can't control the external environment from a physiological standpoint. <clears throat> so our bodies are constantly trying to achieve and maintain this sort of steady state. Our body temperature, we want it to stay around 98.6 degrees. We want our blood sugar levels to stay around a very certain level. We don't want all of this crazy fluctuation, right? That causes stress in our body. But it is really important to remember that homeostasis doesn't mean constant. Our temperature is not always 98.6 degrees. Or, you know, if you're a little bit off, I think every time I take my temperature, it's a little bit below 98.6 degrees. It doesn't stay at that same level. Um, it goes up, it goes down throughout the course of the day. When you're sleeping, you have a different uh, body temperature typically than when you're awake but it's within a normal range. So you have this constant sort of variation around an average. That's what homeostasis is. It doesn't mean it's just flat line, always the same all the time. So it's not constant, but it's, it's within these boundaries or parameters. Has anyone had their, like their blood work done, labs, like your cholesterol and sugar tested? Yeah, so when you get those results back, you see kind of, here's the, hopefully, you see the, the normal range, right? They give you a normal range and then you look at your reading and hopefully that number is within the normal range. So humans vary, that's why there's a range, but also your body varies. So even if your blood sugar is kind of high after you eat, um, it's hopefully still within a sort of normal range for post, uh, post eating. Um, so if you haven't had your blood labs done, it's actually really interesting to kind of look at all those details. They test a lot of stuff, a lot of which is hard to understand, but that's why they have those normal ranges. So we have ranges within what, which our body wants to remain. Doesn't mean they're always the same. You could get your blood work done the next week and you might have slightly different numbers. 
um, but hopefully they're still within that, that range. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about feedback loops here or feedback systems, whatever you want to call them. First, I want to talk about negative feedbacks. So homeostasis is mostly maintained by what we categorize as negative feedbacks in our body. So there's a lot of text on this slide. I'm going to have positive feedback detail down here. So I apologize for all the text, but I wanted to give you the full definition for each of these. Um, because I think they, they sort of help and then I'll break it down into, okay, this is sort of the take home message of a negative feedback. So the definition of a negative feedback is where it's a mechanism that basically stabilizes an upset in the physiology of your body. So your temperature starts to go up or down. Your body is going to then enter a negative feedback to bring that temperature back down or back up, whichever direction it needs to go. So it's going to move in the opposite, opposite direction of the stimulus. So if your temperature is rising, 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 the negative feedback loop within your body will kick in and then it'll bring that temperature in the opposite direction back down. If you're going towards hypothermia and you're really cold, it'll go the opposite way. So it'll bring your temperature back up. So negative feedback just means that it's going to stabilize an upset by moving, kind of moving the needle in the opposite direction where it's currently going. Hopefully that makes sense. So I put three really common and easy to understand, fairly easy to understand, examples of negative feedbacks in our body. This is a very small portion. Um, temperature regulation, blood pressure, and blood glucose levels. So um, I kind of was describing the temperature regulation aspect, um, but I want you guys, rather than me kind of going into more detail, if you guys can group up, stay in your seats so we kind of keep enough separation, but talk to the people behind you or around you, like groups of two or three, and you guys on Zoom, I'm gonna to try to put you in breakout groups. It might take a long time, but I'm gonna to try to make that happen. And with temperature regulation in particular, I think that's something most people kind of understand. So explain to me how temperature regulation is an example of a negative feedback in our body, how it maintains that homeostasis, and maybe an example of when this is gonna kick in. So you guys group up in here, however you want to, and then on Zoom, let's see. This might take a minute, guys, but hang on. I'm gonna, gonna put you in breakout groups just for like a couple minutes. Okay, so you guys are going to head in and then I'll bring you back in a couple minutes. So discuss why temperature feedback is um, a negative feedback mechanism and kind of how that works uh, from your understanding. I'm going to give the people on Zoom just a few more minutes. So 
If you're done, that's fine. <laughs> you can keep chatting. <laughs> oh, dang it. Okay. I think everyone's back. Okay, so um, let's start with um, someone on Zoom. So you guys hopefully kind of came up with an example. Um, I don't want to leave you guys out on Zoom. So I'm going to ask you guys first. Does someone want to offer up an explanation as to why temperature regulation is a negative feedback mechanism or give an example about what you guys talked about in your group? I will. Okay, go for it. Um, we were just talking about like maybe hypothermia could be example could be an example of temperature regulation because like your body drops down to such an extreme point and then it would come back if you get out of the cold. I would say. Right, exactly. Yeah. So if your temperature is going down and then your body is automatically going to want to raise that temperature back up. So go in the opposite direction, right? That's the negative feedback aspect. So it'll start to, um, you might start to shiver or you might start to, um, your, your blood vessels will start to constrict a little bit. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so your temperature rises. Exactly. That's a perfect example of how temperature regulation can be a negative feedback. Anyone in the classroom have another good example, maybe in the opposite direction? Yeah. She had a really good one. Um, she was talking about how sometimes when you get an infection, your body just rises yeah. because of it. Yeah, exactly. So for those of you on Zoom may not have heard that. Um, when you get sick, an infection or some kind of other pathogen coming into your body, you your temperature starts to rise to kill that pathogen which is good, but in the end, your body's gonna to need to bring that back down, right? So the negative feedback would be that bringing it back down. It's not just gonna keep rising and rising, ideally. <laughs> good, those are great examples, perfect. Thank you guys, let's share that. Okay, so if there's negative feedback, does anyone wanna give any more examples? I don't wanna leave anyone out who thought they had a great explanation. Those are kind of the main ones. Anyone on Zoom? So if there's a negative feedback, there's probably a positive feedback loop too, right? <laughs> and these are just general categories. Um, so positive feedback, whoops. positive feedback doesn't really contribute to homeostasis. So when you think about homeostasis, we're trying to get away from extremes and go towards the middle. Positive feedback moves an individual or physiology towards an extreme. So change is gonna make more change in that same direction whatever direction that is. So that's the idea behind a positive feedback, which is why it doesn't contribute to maintaining a steady state. It just amplifies that physiological reaction. It makes it bigger and bigger. Um, so it's not resetting the stage. Some good examples of this, blood clotting, thankfully. Um, so when you cut yourself, if you cut your hand when you're making dinner, for example, your blood, um, your circulatory system will send platelets towards that cut, which will start to close up that wound, basically clot it, right? So liquid blood doesn't keep coming out. So your blood will clot. And then the more platelets that are sent there and the more clotting that happens, that um, stimulates your body to send even more platelets. So it kind of amplifies that clotting scenario. Hopefully that makes sense. It just makes it so there's more and more clotting as clotting starts. So you kind of get minimal clotting and then that's gonna send a signal to your body to send more platelets, more platelets until that is clotted. Obviously there's an endpoint. You don't want all of your blood clotted in your body. 
Um, so it doesn't continue on um, infinitesimally or into infinity. Two really important um, reproductive aspects in women. So women typically have a few more interesting positive feedback mechanisms than men, and it deals with childbirth and then child rearing. So uterine contraction is one example. Um, and I'll talk about that and we'll get to it today. Probably not. Um, so uterine contraction, as the uterus starts to contract, when a woman goes into labor, that sends a signal to the brain to release a hormone to make that uterus contract even more. So more and more contractions. Um, so that's gonna be a positive feedback as more and more of that hormone is sent to the uterus to tell it to contract further and further to get the baby out. Uh, milk production, same idea. So during breastfeeding, um, the more a baby eats, the more milk the mother will produce. So if the baby cuts back on how much milk it's eating, the milk production will cut down. So it'll go in that same direction. If the baby's eating and drinking a lot of milk from the mom, the body, the mom's body will produce more and more milk. So those are good examples of positive feedbacks. They're not nearly as common in the body as negative feedbacks and they don't contribute to homeostasis. That's the take home message. Positive feedback does not contribute to homeostasis. It doesn't mean they're not important. Obviously, these are really important physiological aspects. Um, but they just don't contribute to keeping a steady state. <clears throat> okay, I think you guys sort of understand this, but um, this negative feedback temperature mechanism, I just put this diagram up here. I'm just going to go kind of right past it, but it's like a thermostat. When your body temperature um, decreases, the thermostat in your body kind of kicks on, raises the body temperature. Once it's up to the right level, the thermostat will kick off and then um, your body temperature will be at the right level. Inevitably, your body temperature might go back down if you're out, well, it's not that cold today, but say you're in Alaska in the winter and your body temperature goes back down, that thermostat will kick back on every time it needs to raise the temperature. So that's the idea that you guys had a really good understanding of that, it seems like, of the negative feedback of temperature regulation. And here's just a diagram showing that in a person, basically. So um, kind of like this diagram, I think graphs can kind of help explain things um, in, a, in a nice way that maybe words cannot. So if we have the body temperature here, 98.6 is the, the goal or the set point. So that's the, the ideal temperature, which most of us aren't exactly at 98.6 most of the day. If we get cold, our blood vessels constrict. That's vasoconstriction. So your blood vessels constrict and move down further away from your skin because they're going to release heat if they're near the skin. So vasoconstriction and shivering, those are kind of those negative feedback mechanisms that will raise the body temperature back up. If we go too far, so we step into a sauna and we get too hot, vasodilation happens. So that's the blood vessels are dilating or widening. That's gonna release more heat from our blood. And sweating obviously releases water, which holds onto a lot of heat. Um, so that's gonna release heat as well and bring the temperature back down to the set point. One more quick example, um, blood pressure. So blood pressure is a really important negative feedback. And this actually, um, we usually think of people who have high blood pressure, low blood pressure, usually high blood pressure in today's society, um, having issues, but our body is constantly sort of going up and down in blood pressure. So when you wake up in the morning, your blood pressure is really low. Your heart hasn't been beating that fast at night, hopefully. Um, so you get up from bed and your blood is going to drain from the upper body, basically. So that sends a signal to these receptors above your heart. The receptors above your heart and those receptors register that drop in blood pressure. If you have really low blood pressure, you pass out. So it's not a good thing. So you need a little increase. So that will send information to your brain. Those receptors send information to your brain, which will then send a signal back to your heart and say, uh, start pumping a little faster heart. We need higher blood pressure so we don't pass out. The blood pressure is gonna rise and you're good. So um, blood pressure is almost in a lot of ways exactly like that negative feedback loop in um, body temperature regulation, just a different system. So this, this happens throughout a lot of different systems in our body. And I think I'll stop there. Yeah, stop there um, and then get into kind of finish up the homeostatic mechanisms on Monday.